Welcome to Winging It. We're looking at deck building today in Arkham Horror the Card Game. Uh, this is part of a series. I'm doing Arkham Horror the Card Game 101, uh, where I'm going to be explaining a little bit more than I normally do, going into details about the cards, about why I'm, not just why I'm putting them in the decks, but how they operate, how they function, what the mechanics of the game are. Um, I'm only using core box cards, although I'm using two core boxes for this, um, and core box investigators and core box scenarios. This is designed to be for people who are looking into the game or just getting started in the game to help them understand how the game works, um, get some familiarity, uh, and, uh, you know, just uh, go in a little, wade in a little bit easier than maybe some of my other videos, which just assume a lot of knowledge about the game already. I'm trying to keep it to my normal format, though, of deck building and plays, and I uh, hope that, that this will just be uh, a little bit more helpful for uh, people just wading into the game. Uh, I'm not going to claim that my decks are the best. I'm not going to claim that I'm going to pilot them well. They say that those who can do and those who can't teach, and clearly right now my goal is to teach. I have not played Roland or Wendy, either one, in a very long time, so... Uh, I, have, I have played them, but uh, I think the last time I played Wendy, at least, maybe even Roland, was uh, you know back in the first cycle when I was uh, just getting into the game. Uh, and uh, I don't even think I ever even played Wendy's Amulet, uh, which, you know, is I, I think now is kind of a cardinal sin, but we'll get to that. Anyway, um, let's uh, dive right in and take a look at Roland. So this is Roland Banks, the Fed. He's kind of the iconic investigator when it comes to this game. Um, he is a guardian class. Guardians tend to be um, protectors, fighters. We do think of it as kind of the combat class. They also have some healing, things like that. So, um, and his off class, uh, he is kind of a main class, off class investigators. Off class would be Seeker, which is kind of the investigator -y, uh, you know, uh, find clues, provide some utility, that kind of stuff. So, um, he his his biggest weakness is uh, his five sanity, which is uh, pretty low. At this time, there are no lower sanity investigators than uh, than Roland. Um, there's a few other investigators who share his low sanity, um, but it's definitely a significant weak point. Something you have to think about. Uh, when you're building your decks and you know kind of how to mitigate that so um, he has nine health which allows him to take up to nine damage uh, so damage goes towards your health horror goes towards your sanity um, so he can take a lot of damage the nobody has higher than uh, <clears throat> nine health in this game so he's very he's very uh, physically resilient he's just not very mentally resilient um, so the, one of the first things to look at when you look at investigator is the stat line across the top um, so I will tell you the numbers basically mean this. Three means ah, you can do whatever it is that needs to be done. You're kind of mediocre at it. Four means, hey, you've really got this licked. You're really good at that particular stat. Five, uh, there's a very few investigators who have fives in stats, means you're basically S tier. You're really good at that. kind. Of, you're going to lean hard into that. Uh, into that stat. Two means uh, don't even bother. You're you're you know pretty poor at whatever that thing is. And then if you have one, it's just like well, you know, <laughs> not going to be passing those tests. Um, so talking about tests, this game is basically built up on tests, and you will use these stats to you know to pass various kinds of tests. Um, willpower is usually used to pass um, tests that are. Uh, there are encounter cards, they'll be kind of one-time events, they'll do something bad to you and you can prevent it by having a high willpower. At three willpower, Roland is pretty average, he'll fail a lot of those tests, he'll pass some of those tests. Uh, so it's something that you'll want to find a way to boost so you can um, do much better, get up to a, a, you know, a five or a six. Uh, to avoid those bad things happening to him, especially since a lot of those bad things can uh, deal horror to you, which of course he can't handle very well. Um, intellect is the primary way that you get clues in this game, and clues are the primary way you advance what you're trying to do. Clues represent um, kind of abstractly learning knowledge about the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, and so getting clues is the most important thing you do in this game in most cases. Um, being so-so at it 
eh, it's not great. So Roland does have other ways of getting clues though, and he can investigate if he needs to. Um, now fighting, for a fight, he does well. He can beat things up, he can shoot them, he can take care of enemies. And actually, as you'll see, that's, he has kind of a way to use that to get clues, so that's good. Now, agility um, is a stat, kind of people thought it was kind of a bad stat in the early days. Um, some people probably they still think it is. The thing, the reason, one of the big things about that is both in the core and in Dunwich, the first cycle, it's not tested very much, and it's not very effective to use it for its primary use, which is to evade enemies. Although, you can get value out of evading enemies, um, but... In nine times out of ten, you just feel like I'd rather just, you know, instead of running away from it, I'd rather just defeat it and make it go away permanently. Um, it does become more useful in, in later um, uh, in later cycles, and I do think people uh, tend to undervalue it, but uh, Roland is not going to be evading. He's not going to be using that stat much. He is instead going to be using his combat, and he's going to stand his ground, and he's going to fight. Now, every investigator has a special ability. His ability is printed right here on his card. It's a free trigger, which means it doesn't take an action. It just means it's an optional thing that you can do, and uh, it'll give you right here the condition, which is after you defeat an enemy. So after is kind of a, it's a word that tells you when you can do stuff. There's when, after, and if uh, are kind of the, 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 the keywords that are important um, that deal with timing. I won't go into those uh, right now, but this is pretty straightforward. After you defeat an enemy, discover one clue at your location. So I said he can get clues through alternate means. Whenever he kills an enemy, he can get a clue. Now it does say limit once per round. So he can't just do it, you know, over and over and over again. He has to wait and you know, do it as he goes. But it's actually a very strong ability to be able to just pick up clues by fighting. It means he doesn't have to lean this so hard into intellect to be useful in that way. Um, now, Elder Sign is whenever you draw an Elder Sign from the bag, you're going to be, I'll go into tests later in the other video, but what a test, you know, how the, what the mechanics of a test is. But one of the tokens, and it's usually one of like 14 to 19 or 20 tokens, kind of the range of how many tokens in that bag, um, can be an Elder Sign effect. And you pull that out and you you look at your investigator and see what that means. In this case, it means plus one for each clue on your location. So if you're taking a fort, uh, a, um, a fight test, and you're sitting on a location with three clues, um, and you're you know you're fighting at four, then all of a sudden you're fighting at seven. So you're more likely to pass the test. So let's take a look at on the back of uh, Roland's card is going to be his deck building requirements. Um, and you can see that all of the core and set investigators follow the same template. And this is not a template that's used through the entire game, but it is used uh, through the core, which is, and it, it's often used and repeated through a lot of the different cycles in the game. Um, first of all, deck size 30, which is fairly standard. I would say 90% of uh, the investigators have a deck size of 30. Um, and, uh, and along with that, you can include two of each card by name, uh, in in a deck, unless there are some other restrictions that may apply or there's some things that may change it, but that's typically the way to think about it. Um, so you can put 15 two of cards, or you could put, um, you know, 14 two of cards, and then four one of cards, and you know those are the ways that you get to your uh, your your 30. So anyway, um, or. I did the math wrong there. It's 14 two of cards and two one of cards. Math is hard. Anyway, um, so we can take, uh, when I say it's a templated that's in the core is that they have a main class and an off class. His main class, you can take zero to five guardian and seeker cards level zero to two. Now, all of these are level zero cards. As we go, I will show you what leveled up cards look like. Um, you can also take neutral uh, level zero to five. Um, you start with all level zero cards. So even though it says zero to five or zero to two, you can't actually use any cards but level zero cards in your starting deck. But this is a progression style game. As you are successful, or even if you're unsuccessful, you will get uh, experience points that you can use to buy better cards for your decks and upgrade your decks. Um, it also says that he has three additional cards on top of that 30 cards, which is pretty normal. You usually have a deck of 33. Um, it's so he hits his roll in 38 special, cover up, which is a weakness, and one random basic weakness. So you'll generally have two weaknesses in your deck. One that's tied specifically to your investigator, and then one that is chosen at random. 
and it's called a basic weakness. Uh, that's kind of a pool that all, all investigators can pull from. Um, so that's one of the distinctive features about this game is that your, your characters are flawed. Um, they have issues they have to deal with, and that's represented by your deck not only containing good cards, but also containing cards that can hurt you. Um, so yeah, nothing is for free in this game. You've, you've got you've to gotta fight all your way through it, including even through your own deck. So, we're going to take a look at the cards now that I, I have chosen for his deck. Um, again, I've chosen only core cards. Um, there are three different types of cards, uh, at least player cards, that go into your deck. There's also the weaknesses, but even those fall into these types of cards. Um, so you have assets, events, and skills. This entire top row of cards here are assets that I'm putting into Roland's deck. Now, assets are cards that have a cost on the top, like this card has a four cost on the top. You have to pay four resources to put it into play. Um, and then it just goes into play and it sits in front of you and it has an effect. In this case, it has a fight effect. You can spend uh, an ammo off of this and do a fight. And we'll get into those mechanics later. Also, assets may take up a slot, like this takes up a hand slot, um, or it might not take up a slot at all. And slots are just limited. So you can't, you know, if you can't have three guns out at once you know um, there is a card that can give you an extra hand slot later for weapons things like that but in general you only have two hands so if you want to you know you want to carry around uh, three weapons you can't okay so that's assets they just sit on the table some assets like uh the beat cop here um have they have uh damage and horror soaks you can apply damage and horror to him before you do uh to roland if you want so that's nice. Um, the other thing you may have noticed is they, these cards say, like, we'll look at Roland's signature weapon here. I have icons on them. Okay, this is, there's a difference between playing a card and committing a card. These card, these terms are kind of important. Playing an asset means you just spend the cost, you put it out in front of you, and it sits there and it does its thing. And these icons here mean nothing when you do that. And alternatively, you can commit this card, which basically you are going to say, I'm taking a fight test. Okay. I'm going to commit this card, it goes in your discard, so then you can't play it anymore, so you're paying a cost to do this, okay? You don't have to pay this cost up here, though. You're just losing the card, and you get to add the combat. Now, you don't, you also, this question mark means that can stand for, you know, any stat. So you could add two fight uh, stats if you commit this card. So you can commit most um, assets, or you can, uh, you can play them for their effect. Now I have these, here are events. Um, events are one-time effects. You still play the cost, okay? Still pay the cost up here, or you can commit them, but you pay the cost and then you read the text and whatever this text down here is, that's the effect that you're going for. Now the other thing we have here are skill cards. And skill cards are uh, just, you, they have no cost. You cannot play them in any sense. You can commit them. And you only commit them for the for these icons here, and they may have an effect that also goes into play when you uh, commit them. So those are the three kinds of tests, uh, three kinds of cards. So let's take a look at Roland's uh, thirty-eight special. This is his uh, signature weapon. Okay. So this is an asset. You spend three, you put it on a table, or you could commit it. But normally you'd want to um, to play it. It takes up a hand slot, so you can only play it. If you uh, have a hand slot free, or if you do have a, something in your hand slot, it will remove something in your hand slot out of it. Okay, it says you uh, uses four ammo. So when you play this, you put four ammo tokens on it, or resource tokens are typically used for ammo. Um, and then it has this action. This kind of arrow means to take an action. Uh, so uh, when you take an action, you uh, your the bold keyword is which action you're doing which in this case is to fight and it gives you plus one combat when you use that action uh, so uh, that moves him from his four combat to being five combat which helps him pass whatever combat test he's taken um, it also says um, if there's one or more clues in your location you get plus three fight instead which makes it much easier for him to uh, to hit things if he is uh uh, if he's fighting on locations with clues, which is good because his ability can get one of those clues if he kills something. So, you know, it kind of all works together. Um, it also says this attack deals plus one damage. That is because a fight action 
normally deals one damage. Um, plus one damage means that if you shoot somebody with his gun, it will do two damage. So that is nice. Uh, that's how he, that's, that's how his weapon operates. Now, I will, this is a, a something that comes up frequently. It's like, well, what if I have Roland's 38 special and I have a 45 automatic, which is very similar, and both of them give me this fight combat. Does that mean that I can use this one, this fight, and this action to get to for him to be fighting at six? The answer is no. You can't do that um, because this fight bonus here only applies when you're taking this action. And if you're taking this action, you're not taking the action on this weapon. Okay, so you can only be taking one action at a time on one item. Now. I'll go ahead and spoil the beat cop here. The beat cop says you get plus one combat. Notice this is not tied uh, to an action. This is just he's on the table. And if he's on the table, if he's in play, you're getting plus one combat. So if a beat cop is out and you take this action, or the fight action, you will, he will be fighting at six because he gets plus one from the beat cop and plus one from the, uh, the special. So that's kind of the way that works. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, when this runs out of ammo, you don't get rid of it. It just stays on the table. Um, the only way to get rid of it is either if a car of a negative effect discards it or if you play over it with some other weapon. And if you, say, have one hand slot with this in it and your other hand slot is free and you play another weapon, uh, that would go down and this would stay in play. All right, so let's look at his signature weakness. Okay, this is a bad card that goes in his deck. And you notice this is weakness. It also says treachery on it. Treachery cards normally come from the encounter deck, which is the deck that's working against you. Um, but uh, your weaknesses also will end up being treacheries uh, a lot of the time. So the revelation effect, that's what you do when this card shows up. You don't get a choice. Okay, and it just says put cover up into play in your threat area with three clues on it. So you put th three clue uh, tokens on it. And then there's this free trigger. When you would discover a clue, remember this, this, this free trigger makes it optional. You don't have to do this. But when you would discover one or more clues at your location, discard that many clues from cover up instead. So instead of spending his time trying to advance whatever you're trying to do, he can spend his time trying to cover things up. Um, you know, that's what feds do, right? Um, and then forced. When the game ends, if there are any clues on cover up, you suffer one mental trauma. So a trauma would mean, if he got a mental trauma, that means the next scenario he would start with, he would have, uh, he would start with one horror on him already. Or if he had two traumas, it would be two horror. So you want to go ahead and do this task. Um, with his sanity being such, um, you know, such a weak spot for him, you definitely want to, uh, not take horror if you can, uh, you know, can afford, can, can avoid it anyway. Now, well, I got two of these automatics. Okay, this is a card that I chose to put in the deck. This is kind of like your baseline weapon. Um, I would say to determine a whether a weapon is good or not, you would always want to kind of compare it to automatic, and that would give you a good idea of how good it is. In the early days, um, you'll probably want to put this in most of your guardian decks um, as your card pool progresses. Um, there are some, you know, depending on your investigator, some cards that may, uh, you know, function a little bit better in a given deck or whatever, but this is a good baseline for evaluating uh, a weapon. So, it, like uh, Roland's 38 Special, um, it takes four ammo. Like his 38 Special, he gets plus one combat, but he doesn't get a bonus if there's clues. It costs four instead of um, the three that his special costs. It only gives you an agility icon which is kind of worthless for uh, Roland since his agility is not really the way he's going to want to do it um, and it also um, it gives plus one damage and uh, a lot of players will only put weapons in their decks that will do plus one damage they want to be able to get that you know if I've got a four health enemy I want to be able to take it down in two shots so um, that's and there's that's there's a lot to be said for for that and I think I, my default is to always make sure that I can do two damage with a weapon before I, I put it in my deck. So um, plus one combat, plus one damage, takes up one hand slot. It's a very effective weapon. You get four shots with it, and then uh, you can't use it any longer. So I got two of those in this deck. Now, this is machete is a, uh, a better weapon than the automatic, and we'll talk about why it's better. Um, it is a three cost so it's cheaper to put into play it has a combat pip so if you don't need to use it 
to put it into play as an asset. Committing it is going to be committing it to tests that Roland wants to take. Um, and then um, the fight is the same plus one combat deals plus one damage as long as um, there's only one enemy engaged with you. It turns out that's not a difficult thing to accomplish. Um, it can be painful when you have lots of player counts, but often you only have one enemy that you're dealing with. And so it's working like a, a, a 45 automatic, except that it doesn't have ammo. You can use it as many times as you want. Um, in fact, this card is so powerful and is used in so many decks that eventually when, there, when there's a rebalancing patch called the Taboo List that came out, this card was on it and uh, it was actually made an XP card because it's so strong. But if you're new to this game, I would not worry about that at all. I'm just saying that to let you know how powerful this card is. In the beginning, you don't have a lot of choices for weapons and it's not really that overly powered when you have a limited card set. Um, it only becomes you know really strong when um, you you know kind of have like the wider card pool and you know there's other cards that you're taking this over so I wouldn't uh, worry too much about that just know this is a very strong card and you probably want it in all of your garden starting decks so now we are going to dip into the uh, his off class and get a magnifying glass magnifying glass is very cheap it's one resource it has an intellect so we can commit this to an intellect test if he wants to. It has this key word here, fast. What fast means is normally when you play an asset, it takes an action to put into play. Fast means you can play it and it doesn't cost an action. So you have three actions per turn, but you can play a magnifying glass and still have three actions to go. Um, it gives you plus one while investigating and it takes up a hand slot. So you couldn't have for a, a 45 and a machete and a magnifying glass out. But typically, typically with Roland, you'd want to have a magnifying glass out if you can and a weapon. We already looked at the beat cop earlier, but he is an asset that does a lot for Roland. Now he's kind of expensive at four resources, but he does give you the combat. So if you don't need to play him, committing him can be very useful. Um, he gives you the plus one combat when he's on the table. And again, you just have plus one combat whenever he's on the table. He doesn't require a fight action or anything like that. Anything that would look at your combat, you get plus one as long as your beat cop is on the table. Okay. Um, he has a free trigger. You can discard him to deal one damage to an enemy. This kind of lightning bolt looking thing, um, that is a, it doesn't cost an action. You can do as many of those as you want in a, you know, in a, in a given, uh, at a given time, um, although you only have one thing you can do with this, um, and it so it just deals direct damage. It uh, it's direct damage is really nice. Of course, you're spending four resources and an action to get him on the table before you can do that, um, and you no longer get this combat boost. But in a pinch, it can be a good thing to do. Um, he also will soak two damage to horror, so Roland can put damage and horror onto the beat cop before it goes on him. Now, if it takes two horror, you have to discard it. If it takes two damage, you have to discard it. If there's overflow, if you get, say, three horror in one shot, you have to, you once you've exhausted and put as much horror on a beat cop, then you have to overflow it onto Roland or another damage or horror soak if he's got one of those. Um, you can, however, if he say, say you uh, got hit for two damage and two horror, you can put all of that on the beat cop. It all goes on simultaneously. So it's not like you're like, oh, he took two horror. Now I can't put two damage on him. You can actually apply it all at once. So beat cop is a very good card. There is an upgraded version of this card that's even better that we will hopefully, if we do well in the first scenario, be able to get. Now, um, Beat Cop has an ally. That's This is the ally slot down here. You only have one ally slot. So if you have Beat Cop in play, you can't put Guard Dog in play. Or if you have Guard Dog in play, you can't put Beat Cop. Actually, that's not true. You can put them in play. You just have to discard the card that's already there. So Guard Dog, um, a lot of people put two Guard Dogs in the starting Guardian deck. Uh, maybe I should have. I feel like three allies is good. Um, being as they're kind of competing for that slot. So um, Guard Dog, he doesn't give you the combat boost, but what he does give you is a lot of protection. If you get hit by a damage, he has a free trigger. When an, encounter, uh, an enemy attack deals damage to Guard Dog, deal one damage to that attacking enemy. And that's pretty strong. To be able to just do damage back without having to test or do anything, just do damage back, and he can do it three times, that's really good. Plus he has the combat icon we like, and he's only three resources to put into play, which is, which is nice. Next, we are going to look at physical training. This is part of a suite of cards 
that um, are referred to by the community as stat boosters. And I think we talked about this lightning uh, trigger before. Um, spend one resource, gain plus one willpower for this test, or spend one resource, you get plus one fight for this test. You can do that as many times as you want, and it will apply for the whole test. So if you uh, want to spend three resources to boost by three, you can do that. Now, the reason these cards aren't fantastic is you know, it costs two resources to put this into play, which already hampers your ability to use the card, which is to spend, you know, more resources. Yeah. So you have to have, you know, a good, you know, at least three or four resources to even make use of this card, which makes it a pretty expensive endeavor. Um, it can be good, especially if you really just need to, to boost up to hit something. And, you know, this does give Roland a way to deal with his three willpower, which is kind of vulnerable. Um, but, and of course, you can always commit it for a fighter willpower, which is, you know, free to do. Um, but there's an upgraded version of these that you can get later on with your collection that only costs zero to put down. And I find those to be a lot more effective because you're not, you know, hurting your ability to use the card by putting it into play. But we may get to see you play it. Now we have Emergency Cash. This is uh, a fantastic card. It's a card that you'll probably be putting in decks for a long, long time. I would say 90% or higher use Emergency Cash. It's very straightforward. It has no icons to commit. It's just a zero cost. Put it down, gain three resources. Very simple, very straightforward. It's a good economy card. It's uh, in the in the core box. There's not a lot of options for getting resources, um, so this is one of them. Very good. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of expensive assets to play. We've got you know, his his weapons are four and three. His beat his allies are four and three. The stat boosters, all of that. Uh, you know, an infusion of three resources is is very good. So we definitely want to include uh, emergency cash. The next event does have icons. It has two analog icons, so you may consider just committing this to a test. But the other thing this does, you can spend two resources, and this is fast. Remember, fast you can just play uh, pretty much any time. Now, if you want to get into the minutia, there's a thing called player windows. You can look into the, the rules to find out when exactly these cards can be played. Um, basically, during tests, yeah, there's some other times you can play it. but. When you're starting out, just know that when you want to play this, you probably can play it. Um, there's a difference between fast on an event and fast on an asset. Assets can only be played um, during your turn, but events can be played uh, pretty much any time. So uh, being able to say, get a clue, that's great. You don't have to take a test. You can just take a clue. It just costs you two resources to be able to do it. All right, so we have another event here. This is Dodge. Um, it has uh, willpower and agility. It costs a one. Now this is fast, but it has a condition on it. It says play when an enemy attacks an investigator at your location. So you can't just play this any old time. You can only play it when an enemy attacks an investigator at your location. Um, it's not bolded, but when is an important word. It tells you uh, when something can occur. There's three kind of tiny words. There's when, there's if, and there's after. Um, but you don't need to worry about really what those things mean right now. It's something to look into later as you get more comfortable with the rules. But for now, just know that it's important. Okay. So when an enemy attacks at an, uh, an investigator location, you can play this card if you have one resource to play. And it just says cancel that attack, which is very effective. It means not only can um, Roland prevent himself from taking damage and horror, but he can play this card to prevent somebody else. Like say Wendy's at his location, you can prevent her, prevent her from getting attacked. So it's a very useful card. And we have next card is called evidence. Um, again, this has got two agil two um, intellect, which is nice, and maybe you just want to use that to help him pass uh, a test to get to uh, to get clues. Um, but you can play it for its effect. It's one again. This is another fast card, and it's another. This is an after. Okay, um, so you play after you defeat an enemy. So once you've completely resolved the action as being an enemy defeating an enemy and all of that entails you can spend one resource play this card and you can discover one clue at your location much like working a hunch but this one's conditional working a hunch costs two resources and you can just play it to get clue this one requires you to do some fighting first now notice that this is just like roland ability which is you know after he defeats an enemy he can get a clue limit once per round he can play this and get two clues one from roland's ability one from this okay now this is a bomb card 
This is why I only put one in. This is the kind of card that is it has a big effect. It's uh, useful rarely, but when it does, it comes up big. And it's also actually a bomb card. It's a dynamite blast. It costs five resources, which is very hard to, to afford. It's it's not very often you're going to have five resources hanging around as a guardian. He's just, you know, look at all the other things he's got to play. Um, and it says, choose either your location or connecting location. Deal three damage to each enemy and to each investigator at the chosen location. Which means he would do damage to himself if he threw it at his own feet. Uh, but sometimes it's a good idea. Doing three damage testlessly is very, very strong, especially if you have enemies grouped together. And I don't always take this in a Guardian deck. I do try to take one in the core campaign because um, this kind of operates as a tech card. A tech card meaning it's you know designed for you know a certain situation. Um, and there's definitely a situation in the third scenario of the core box where this can come up big for you. So that's why I've included it here. All right, this is uh, one of the most standard cards that you can take. We're getting to skill cards now. Um, this uh, has no cost. It, it, you can only commit it, but it, you commit it for an effect. You get the one combat boost. So, you know, if you're fighting at, with a machete, you would be at five. You add this, fighting at six. Okay, but the effect is this. If the skill test is successful during an attack, that attack deals plus one damage, which is really nice. Um, it's good if you don't have a weapon out, you could be hitting for two. If you do have a weapon out, you could be hitting for three. Uh, good for odd health enemies. It's uh, so you don't have to waste two ammo killing a uh, three health enemy. Um, it's it just adds damage. This is you'll almost always be taking this card in most guardian decks. I think um, it's just really good when you need to do a little bit of extra damage. All right, deduction is a similar card, but Seeker style. This is for getting clues. Um, you add an intellect, makes it more likely for you to, to pass that test. And then the uh, text on this is, if this skill test is successful while investigating a location, discover one additional clue at this location. So, Vicious Blow lets you do additional damage, Deduction lets you get an extra clue. All right, here we have a staple card, Unexpected Courage. Unexpected Courage just lets you add two of any stat to a test. It does say max one committed per skill test, and that means across investigators. So if um, if uh, Roland was committing this to a test, Wendy couldn't also commit one to the same test, which is something I haven't mentioned about, about cards. When you're committing cards to test, you can commit cards to another investigator at your location, or one card. You can't commit multiple cards. You can commit one card. Um, so if, say... Roland's taking a willpower test, he could put an unexpected courage, and then Wendy's there, she could also throw a card in with an icon on it. Unexpected courage is just so flexible and useful that a lot of decks, especially when you have a limited collection, is uh, you'll you'll find that in a lot of decks. Okay, perception is essentially the same thing, but it only works for intellect. So this is good, especially if you're planning to get clues. Um, and this also has the max one commander per test, but it also has this, if this test is successful, draw one card, which is leads, leads people to call, there's there's one for each different stat. Um, people will call this a cantrip, uh, you know, of uh, kind of a legacy term for Magic the Gathering. Um, but anyway, it's good. You can draw a card, you can keep your hand full, and you can pass tests to get clues. So that's what that's for. All right. Now, um, the other I have included in uh, Roland's deck here is Guts. Um, it's the same thing as Perception, but it is for willpower. And uh, again, max one per minute test. If this is successful, draw one card. This is a card you should consider in a lot of decks, uh, at least early on. Um, wanting to, you need to be able to beat willpower tests with only three. Um, you know this. Committing this card to a test will get rolling up to five, which is pretty good. Um, the the game will always be testing your willpower, uh, just always pushing it, always doing bad things to you if you fail it. So guts is always something I would at least start off with in your deck and then cut it if you don't think you need it. But it's uh, of of all the skill cards of all the cantrips, um, it's probably the most useful. So, and then we have, uh, this, this is a random weakness that I drew. Uh, I drew two weaknesses from the core cards. Uh, you will, um, if you have two core boxes, you only use one set of weaknesses to draw from. 
Um, I actually use an app, Arkham Cards, uh, on my iPhone to draw my weaknesses. Um, but yeah, this uh, has a revelation effect. Uh, choose and discard all but one card from your hand. I will say this is what I think is one of the harshest in the game. And as a matter of fact, there's other later cards that people will say are, you know, are really, really bad and they really hate having that card. But to me, you know, I put all these cards in my deck because I want to play them because they are my tools for being able to progress my character. And having to discard all but one is really hitting at that. I, I think Amnesia is one of the harshest weaknesses in the game, even today. Uh, I'm not happy to have it, but part of this game is embracing you know, the, the the hard things, embracing the negative things, embracing when things go bad. So I'm going to embrace Amnesia and the opportunity uh, that, that will show yeah, give me to show you how brutal that it can be. So, all right, that is Roland. I am now going to uh, stop and take a look at Wendy. And this is Wendy. Wendy is uh, the second recommended investigator that the core box uh, tells you to play. Which is kind of an interesting choice because she does kind of fit the uh, high skill floor, high skill cap uh, kind of investigator. She actually is one of the most powerful investigators of the game. And she's not very straightforward to play. And she doesn't have just the best card support, I don't think, in the uh, core box. And I'm certainly not uh, great at playing Wendy, so you might get to see, uh, you know, Roland's pretty straightforward. You know, kill stuff, get clues, that's it. Uh, Wendy has to do things a little bit differently. And uh, she is a, a survivor, which uh, means survivors are all around. Uh, you have guardians are all about, uh, you know, uh, fighting and protecting. Survivors are all about mitigating failure. And um, it just uh, failure doesn't hurt them as bad. Uh, sometimes they even profit from it. Uh, but, you know, having some bad luck or whatever generally doesn't hurt survivors nearly as bad as every other class. So they kind of accomplish their what they do in spite of the odds being against them, hence the you know, survivor class. Um, so I don't know that I'm a particularly pilot or deck build her well, and I, I did struggle uh, picking cards, and I almost picked just every card that she could take from the core box to build this out. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see, you know, how that pilots. But anyway, let's take a look at Wendy Adams. The uh, orphan. So that is Wendy. She has this wonderful stat line. She has a four willpower, which makes her pretty resilient to the encounter deck. A three intellect. Uh, so like uh, Reich Roland, she can get clues, but she's not going to be great at it. She has a one fight, which means she just really isn't going to be. She's not going to be fighting. That's just not how. She's not going to be. Uh, you know, hitting enemies with uh, weapons and hurting them. Um, later on, there are some weapons that she can use that uh, can make it possible. But uh, yeah, certainly not in the core box is she going to be fighting with her combat. Um, her agility four is very, very strong. And I had mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, in the core box, in, in um, the first cycle, agility wasn't tested uh, too much or it's not as useful. Um, and that's true, but it's still not like there are still places that you can use it and I'm going to do my best to try to find those and, and use those because um, having that strong agility is is definitely uh, you know something that she can use to her advantage now the the, the key with Wendy is her uh, her investigator ability because when you reveal a chaos token choose and discard one card from your hand cancel that chaos token and return it to the bag reveal a new chaos token limit once per uh, test or ability so this is <laughs> I mean, this is pretty, uh, is kind of cuts to the core of what a survivor is. Uh, you know, draw the uh, auto fail and you don't know just toss it back. Let me try again, you know, just for the small price of ditching a card, which is certainly worth it. So, um, survivors don't have to commit as she doesn't have to commit as much to a test, um, because she always has the chance of, you know, of redraw. Um, she has better odds. So, as it's just a very very strong ability, maybe one of the maybe the strongest investigator ability in the game, even even today. Um, her elder sign effect is plus zero. If her amulet's in play, you automatically succeed instead. Honestly, you're gonna try to be up to where a zero is a pass anyway. So it's it's her elder sign effect is not that strong, but um, you know, I mean, it, you're usually gonna pass the test, so that's something. She's an even seven seven with her health and sanity, which is a pretty good spot for her to be in. It makes her pretty resilient. And then her deck building, 
Uh, she is uh, like Roland. She is 30. She can take 0 to 5 uh, neutral cards. And then her main class is Survivor. Off class is Rogue. Um, so she can take a 0 to 5 uh, Survivor cards, which is you know a little bit of a joke since Survivors don't have anything that goes above 3. Even uh, you know several cycles into the game, they still don't have anything that goes above 3. Um, but Rogue cards, level 0 to 2. So she can't take any of the really, really nice Rogue cards. Um, but it kind of fits into to, to where she's at. And, and I'll be leaning a little you know into rogue for her ability to you know to deal with enemies so um and then she also has you know the uh, the amulet which is her asset she has a man alone which is her weakness and then she has a, a random basic weakness that uh, i've added into the deck so that is wendy let's take a look at her cards So here's her amulet. Um, first of all, it's uh, two resources. This is gonna be an asset. You're gonna throw it down on the table. It's gonna have a persistent effect. You could also commit it for two uh, wild icons if you need to. Um, it takes up her um, the accessory slot, which Roland then didn't use that, but she will. Um, and I don't have anything competing for that slot. There are some cards that she could take uh, in the core box, Lucky Rabbit's Foot being one that can compete for that accessory slot. And you only have one, uh, so you know I, I really don't want to try to try to balance that. So I didn't take Lucky Rabbit Rabbit Foot with her, but anyway, um, the effect this has when it's on the table is you may play the topmost event in your discard pile as if it were in your hand. Now you'll find that in Survivors, recursion is kind of a theme. Being able to do things with their discard pile, they're the, they're the one faction that can take cards and play them out of their discard pile consistently. Um, that's her way of doing it, is she can just uh, take events and then she plays them. And then it says forced. After you play an event, place it on the bottom of your deck instead of in your discard pile. So you don't get to just play an event and play it and play it and play it like that. It's going to go under uh, you know, under her deck and then eventually you'll get to it again. Um, now, it, it, you can get to a situation when you have her amulet out that like you're sitting on basically three cards in your in your deck and you're just recurring them over and over and over again and uh, that can be very very powerful if it's the right three cards um so let's take a look at her weakness which is uh, abandoned alone okay, revelation take two horror direct horror so direct um, means that you can't place it on a soak. She couldn't put it on an ally. She can't put it on anything that has health or sanity. She just has to put it right on herself. That makes her seven sanity really effectively a five sanity because you're probably going to hit this card. And then also um, remove all cards in your discard pile from the game. So when it does say remove from the game, it's it's not talking about from like the rest of the campaign. It's just for you know this one scenario that you're doing. But it's not in your discarding pile. It's just removed. It can't enter. You can't enter with those cards anymore. So if you've got some nice you know events built up that you're planning to use your amulet for, this will just remove them and get rid of them. So that's kind of it's kind of annoying. Okay, so Flashlight is, uh, this is a, a two-cost asset. You put it down. You could also commit it for an intellect icon if you want. Um, it has three supplies. Supplies, ammo, charges, they're all kind of basically the same thing. Um, you would just put um, a resource token on it to represent that. It sticks up a hand slot. Um, you can spend a supply and investigate. Your location gains negative two shroud for this investigation. I haven't gone over what shroud is. Um, basically every location or nearly every location that I'm aware of in the game has a shroud. Um, it's a value that you have to beat if you want to find a clue, if you want to investigate at that location. Um, so if you were say at a two shroud location and you use this action on a flashlight, uh, then that would lower the shroud down to zero, which is nice. Um, you actually cannot resolve a test lower than zero. So even if you would to pull a negative four out of the chaos bag, you know, and go down to negative two, it will, you would end up at zero and still able to get the clue. So flashlight is really nice for one and two shroud locations. And with her being at three, you know, if, uh, if she's a three shroud, lo lo three shroud location and she uses this flashlight and gets it down to one, um, then she's, you know, two up on that test. She's testing at three versus one, which is very likely to pass. So flashlight is just a way for Wendy to get clues and kind of, you know, helps her get clues. 
I have one ally in her deck. The the two allies that she has uh, available to her are Leo DeLuca, which is uh, this and this um, this ally, and Stray Cat. And I'm not a huge fan of Stray Cat and her because what Stray Cat lets you do is to easily evade things. And she already can easily evade things because she's got her four agility. So, uh, yeah, it's not... Uh, I, Leo is... The problem with Leo, of course, is his expense. We haven't seen anything this expensive yet in this deck building. Six resources is a lot, but he gives you a nice effect. First of all, he's got the same damage and horror soak as Beat Cop, two damage, two horror, but his act, when he's on the table, it says you may take an additional action during your turn, which means um, you can take four actions every, every turn, which is, you know, that's 33% more that you can get done in your turn, provided you have things that you can do with that course the problem is of course you have to use a lot of resources to get him into play but leo is good um he does have this little star up next to his turn that means he's unique so that means that like if wendy plays leo de luca nobody else that she's playing with can play leo de luca um whereas like the beat cops from uh roland are you know they're they don't have that little asterisk so if somebody else wanted to play a beat cop they could they're the red shirts where Leo DeLuca gets, you know, he's more of like on the named roster. So he's a good ally. Um, if you can take care of his actions, he's one of the best allies in the game. So Dig Deep is a similar stat booster to physical training. It lets uh, Wendy use resources uh, to boost her willpower or her agility. Uh, again, that's you know those are her two strong stats, so she can just make sure she can pass tests in those stats if she wants to throw resources at them. And so, burglary is a card. This is a testimony, a testament. This is a testament to um, how difficult I was finding <laughs> to find cards to put in this deck burglary is not a very good card and the reason it's not a very good card is it's um you know, it is an asset with an action on it you can exhaust burglary exhausting once it's exhausted um means you can't use the exhausting effect again so ex it just prevents you from using it again and again and again um you can investigate if you succeed instead of discovering clues gain three resources so i was talking about the shroud and getting clues and investigate is a normal action that you can take to get a clue well here you would investigate um you know against that shroud and uh if let's say it includes you can get resources which is good because she's got a lot of expensive things it's just that at three intellect how often is she really gonna be able to take advantage of this and you know really you know make it worth her time but it is an economy card she needs some resources it's helpful to, to, it's helpful to have given that i didn't have a lot of other options um i'll also notice just to make this point again because it's something that uh is easy to mess up is that both flashlight and this are investigate actions okay but you can't use both these triggers you have to pick one or the other so you can't like say i'm going to use burglary and then lower the shroud by two with the flashlight it just doesn't work that way you have to either be doing a flashlight test or a bur burglary test and that's that now we're into the events which given uh, you know her ability to recur events if she has her amulet out wendy likes events um, so this is emergency cash. So think about that with her amulet out, right? That you could, you know, if you if you played emergency cash, put her amulet out, you could play emergency cash again, and then six resources off of one card. That is pretty nice. Um, we've talked about the other implications of emergency cash in Roland, and it's just nice to, uh, to have that. Now here is Lucky. Lucky is one of the best cards in the game. Really, really strong, even after several, several cycles. It is a fast card. It is a uh, one cost event. It has no icons. Um, play when you would fail a skill test, get plus two to your skill value for this test. Um, so this is one of those cards that lets you under commit to tests. You know, it's like, this is a must pass test. Um, and I know I could fail by four, but you know what? I'm only gonna go up, up by two because I don't really wanna invest too much in this because I know I have a lucky in my hand and I can use this if I fail. Um, it's not so much good for its effect when you play it, but for how much value you can get um, out of not having to take big risks when it's in your hand. You know, you don't have to just be like, oh, I just have to pass this test, so I have to throw everything at it. No, you don't, because you can always be lucky. Very, very strong card. All right, so here we have a fight option. I have two of these in Wendy's deck. 
Um, it could, she could commit it for fight and agility, but you know, I don't know that that's going to be very useful for her. Um, this has a fight option on it, so this is a uh, fight is one of your actions you can take. Um, this uh, is an event, so it's not like you put this down and you can trigger a fight action, right? This is just you do fight when you play this, but it says this attack uses agility instead of combat. So if you're wondering why we were fighting with Wendy with her one combat, now you know she could use her agility instead. And attack does plus two damage. So whereas like Roland's weapons will do, you know, two damage when they hit, this does plus two damage, making it a three damage attack. So this can be a huge attack. Uh, she can do a lot of damage with this. And of course, with her amulet, she could recur it. She could play it again and you know, play it, play the amulet, play it again. So you know, yeah, it's it's it backstab is nice, but she has to be able to you know. Hit, you know, land the agility, have enough agility to make sure she you know, gets the hit in, um, and it's a three cost. It's not it's not cheap. So, but it is a way that uh, our our orphan can can uh, fight. Here's another way that she can fight. This is a uh, sneak attack. It is uh, again it has an intellect and a combat icon. It's a two cost, and it says deal two damage to an exhausted enemy location. Now we haven't really gotten into enemy mechanics and what exhausting means, and I'll get more into that into the playthrough. But if you evade an enemy, um, which you would use your agility to do, then it becomes exhausted, and then you can just play this card and do two damage to it. So it basically, this is a two-step kind of process. First, you would evade the enemy, then you would play your two resources, and play the sneak attack, and do two damage to the enemy. So it's, it's fighting in a, uh, you know, kind of a different kind of way. It's not as straightforward. And I will note that these green cards are rogue cards. Now we'll look at Elusive. Now I mentioned earlier that the Machete was a taboo card later on. Um, you know, when you start looking at uh, kind of that balance patch. Uh, Elusive is another card that is so strong um, that it got nerfed a bit and, you know, and had some XP attached to it. Rightfully so. Um, this is one of the best cards in the game even today. Uh, and it may not seem like it until you understand the value of positioning and what it can do. So yeah, you can uh, commit it again for intellect and agility if you need it. Or you can play and spend two resources for this fast. Play only during your turn. Uh, again, assets you can only play during your turn. Other events that are fast you can play during other windows unless it specifies only during your turn. So this one does. Okay. Um, it's a, the effect is disengage from each enemy engaged with you and move to a revealed location with no enemies, which means you can warp across the map. You can jump to anywhere. The ability to move fast without taking an action and without being hit by enemies is just really, really strong. If you need to get to where you need to be to rescue somebody, if you need to get away, there are lots of reasons that you might need to, to move quickly and get away. And the fact that it's fast uh, just makes it amazing. It's a really good card. So, now we have Look What I Found, a card I like to play just because I love to say, Look What I Found. Now, you could, she could commit this for the uh, intellect icons, just like uh, Roland might want to do that with uh, a card like Evidence, um, you know, to help her pass an intellect test. But, she can also play it for the event, two resources, it's a fast play after, so it's got a condition on it, play after you fail a skill test by two or less while investigating. Discover two clues in your location. This is one of those mitigate failure tests, right? She's failed to do the investigate, oh, but she can pick up two clues instead for doing that, for the low cost of two resources. So um, some people, you'll see some people play this card and they'll, they'll be trying to fail because they want to get the two clues. But honestly, usually this card is best played when you're trying to pass the test and you use this when you accidentally fail. Uh, it's 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 kind of works like lucky in that way that you can undercommit to a test and know that you're going to be happy whether you succeed or fail. Okay, so now we have Cunning Distraction. Now this is a card I would not usually include in most decks, and if I did, I would include one of uh, instead of two of. The reason I'm putting two of here is um, first that I don't have a lot of options for Wendy in the two core boxes that, that I, that I feel like are really good for her. And the second is that this is a good tech card, 
um, for really the same situation that a Dynamite Blast is in for Roland for the third scenario. Um, and it's a very powerful effect. The problem with it is it's just very expensive. But it does have um, a willpower icon and a question mark icon, which means you could be two willpower icons or she could commit it to a test for anything, which is nice. But if she needs to use it for the effect, it's uh, spend five and evade. Automatically evade all enemies at your location, um, which is an un unqualified evade is just really great. It means you're, you're safe from all those enemies for the rest of the turn, and that can be really, really good. Um, of course, you could do this and then do the sneak attack if you wanted to, um, but what's neat, and you might miss about this test, is uh, this card, is that if there's an enemy engaged with Roland, and she plays this card, it will evade that if they're at the same location, even though that enemy is not engaged with her. So it basically exhausts all the enemies, gives you a lot of freedom. It's it's a good card. Again, I do I wouldn't normally take it just because it's so expensive, but uh, it's good for this campaign, and I didn't have a lot of other options. So now we're back to Unexpected Courage. Again, it's just a staple card. Goes into a lot of decks. It's good. For the same reason we included Perception in Roland, we're going to include it in Windy. She's got the three intellect. Um, being able to boost to five, that's good. Help her get clues. She's got to find clues. She's got to pull her, her weight. I also included a Manual Dexterity. This will help her with things like uh, getting that backstab off when she's going to fight with her agility. Or if she needs to evade... Uh, Manual Dexterity is good. Again, it's a cantrip like Perception where it will place itself if you're successful. So it's good for, you know, to lean into her, her uh, agility stat. All right. She has Guts. Again, it's a card that's very strong uh, in the core, being able to pass this Willpower test. She's got four Willpower tests, but you know, there can be some pretty hefty Willpower tests. So Guts is is pretty 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 good staple card. And finally, we'll look at her randomly drawn weakness. Okay, this is a revelation effect. Add haunted to your threat area. You get minus one to each of your skills. So yeah, it just makes her uh, just pretty poor at everything she's doing. <laughs> her her combat becomes zero. Not that, that matters, but you know even her strong agility becomes weaker. Um, and then you can take a double action. So it counts for one action. Uh, in terms of like, you know, I'm taking an action, but you have to pay the cost of two. So later on, we'll get into attack of opportunities, which is when you take uh, an action other than fight, evade, or parley, or resign. Any other action that you would take, um, you'll get hit by a monster if you're engaged, you know, with an enemy. This counts for one action in terms of attacks of opportunity, but it'll take up two actions out of your three available actions in order to clear it. So you have to pay that cost. So uh, this basically will just slow you down. You want to deal with it as soon as possible. Now, one thing that is not necessarily clear to to, to uh, uh, first time players, and it's kind of an exception in the uh, uh, in the rule book that you just need to know about. If you have an asset like flashlight and it's in front of Wendy, Roland can't come over and use this flashlight. Uh, that belongs to her. It's it's in her area. Only she can use the flashlight. But when it comes to treacheries, and this has treachery on it, right? Roland can interact with this. If he's at our location, he could take two actions and clear a haunted, and then it just goes into her discard. So you you can interact with another player's treacheries. You cannot uh, interact with their assets. So that's uh, an important thing to know. So right, this is Roll. This is Wendy, uh, and of course we just took a look at Roland. I have tried to uh, create both of them to be able to get clues and to manage enemies. Uh, it is a thing that when you're building uh, in multiplayer or when, um, you know, or two-handed uh, sometimes that you'll build uh, an investigator, you know, m more towards the combat and another investigator more towards the clues and they have their kind of divine roles. Or maybe you're playing four-player, you'll have one pure combat and one uh, pure investigator and uh, cluver. And then you have two flex, or maybe you have one that leans hard into agility, um, or there's some other kind of utility roles. You know, there's uh, some control control decks that protect you from the encounter deck, or you know, there's um, there's an investigator who might heal or provide support or that kind of stuff. 
But generally, you do think about investigators in terms of enemy management and getting clues. And where do I fit along that spectrum? And I've tried to build these decks so that both Wendy and Roland can do both. They both can get clues. They both can, you know, fight or evade, manage enemies one way or the other. So that's how I built them, or that's how I've tried to build them. We'll see how it goes in practice. So anyway, uh, if you've watched this and you are interested in seeing how the game actually plays, I invite you uh, to... Uh, join me in the other video where we will look at Arkham Horror the Card Game 101 and play actually play a scenario. Uh, thanks for watching and I hope to see you there.